So today we have with us Dr. Will Ross, uh, Dr. Lori Gonzalez, who is the Vice Chancellor for Academic Faculty and Student Affairs here at UT Health Science Center, and myself, Dustin Fulton, from the Office of Equity and Diversity. Dr. Will Ross, a native Memphian, is the Associate Dean for Diversity at Washington University School of Medicine and Professor of Medicine in the Nephrology Division. For over two decades, he has recruited and developed a diverse workforce of medical students, residents, and faculty, all while promoting health equity nationally and globally. He has been instrumental in redesigning local access for health care for the underserved as the founder of the Saturday Free Health Clinic and co-founder of Casa de Salud Latino Health Center. To get started, will you share information about your journey? What led you to medicine and what continues to spark your passion for delivering? high quality and empathetic care. Well, Dustin, first I want to thank you for inviting me and just having us uh, coming back home to Memphis, uh, the place that I love. Uh, and coming back home is, is a great way of asking that question because this is why I chose medicine. I grew up in Memphis um, in the 60s, and uh, when I was five years old, I lived about four blocks away from University of Tennessee uh, Health Science Center, particularly from John Gaston Hospital. And I recall... At, at age five, uh, taking my sister there, who had severe asthma, uh, we were three kids now walking into a hospital and saying, uh, my, our sister is sick, help her. And as you can imagine, three scruffy kids, black poor kids coming in uh, without a parent. It was a, quite a remarkable scene, I'm sure. The, the health care providers are saying, what on earth is going on? But, uh, Dustin, we didn't quite get the level of care that I thought uh, deserving of any anyone in America. Uh, I don't think that we were treated with respect or dignity, irrespective of whether or not our, my mother was with us or not. This was a, and this is a tough time in Memphis when uh, we were still quite, still hyper-segregated, I would say. And so I just remember how we were treated, and I said, you know what, if I have an opportunity to be a doctor, I'm going to set a standard here. I'm going to show that everyone who walks into my office will be treated with dignity, with respect, and I'm going to do everything in my power to create a forum, uh, a curriculum to allow all students across this country to train, to, to really understand the importance of delivering culturally uh, 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 competent and culturally uh, sensitive health care. So I owe my career and my profession to growing up here in Memphis, Tennessee. So we were lucky enough to hear your presentation today when you addressed health equity. So not everyone got to hear it, so we want you to answer why, why it's so critical that we focus on this health equity need in our communities and why it's been so difficult for us to achieve. Uh, well, thanks again. Uh, I really enjoyed having an opportunity to share that this morning. Uh, we had, I think it's really important that we really use these terms correctly because there is indeed a difference between health disparities and health equity. And my European colleagues prefer to use the term health equity. And let me explain why and why that's so important. Health disparities essentially, uh, disparities essentially is the disproportionate burden of disease borne by a group of individuals uh, that's have a group of individuals who have not been uh, allowed access to the usual standard of services, either you know social services or health services. And so this group then has a, a higher level of disease. That, that we understand. When we talk about disparities, uh, in, in, in the eyes of most Americans, that comes across as a zero-sum game. Okay, if this one group has a disparity, then they want to take our resources and reshuffle, and they want to reprioritize, and therefore it's taking something away from me. That is, resources are going to be taken away from my ability to see a private, a private provider because they're going to then fund this, this community health center. That's, they said that's not fair. And this is, what we, this is kind of what happens if we use that term. Health equity, on, on the other hand, is a much more egalitarian term. That really states that every individual has the right to attain his or her highest health potential. It's, it, it, it's, it's, just, it's kind of a, a fact of life. It's like everyone has a right to an attorney. Everyone has to get a, a, a uh, registration and license to drive a car. Well, everyone has the right to obtain his or her highest health potential. That's what we want. It's for all Americans. It's not taking anything away from anyone else. And when we use that language, it's much more inclusive. And people say, you know what, that, that's, a, that's a moral valuation, which I agree with. 
and it draws people together. They say, let's do this. Let's promote health equity. I think that's what we need to do more of in this country. So the semantics, you may say these are semantics. These are powerful words, and that we have to use these words appropriately if we want to really usher in the change we need. So we've been talking about health disparities since um, the out-of-time report from the Institute of Medicine, and we had all the data. And so we've been charging away at this, trying to get to health equity. We're still not there, and the progress has been very slow. What are the barriers for us to get there, and, and you know, what are the steps that maybe an academic health center needs to take? So uh, the, the barriers are really laid out decades earlier by individuals like uh, Sir Michael Marmot, who was uh, the director of the, of the uh, U.S. Commission on Social Determinants of Health <clears throat> for the World Health Organization. And uh, um, Michael Marmot and others, Richard Wilkinson, back in the 70s, 60s era, were talking about how social factors impact health. And that when you look at the grand scheme of things, and you look at all the determinants of health, uh, what we do in the hospital, what we do in the clinical setting, maybe contributes 10% towards the health of an individual. 10%. The other 80 to 90% is due to all those things that happen when we walk out the door. Uh, do they have transportation? Do they have a job? Do they have child care? Are they living in a food desert where they don't have access to affordable uh, high, high quality produce. Uh, are they able to get an education? Uh, these are these are the social factors, the social determinants of health that really drive uh, our 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 health, individual health as well as our community health. And so, um, so we have to create a curriculum, uh, not just for our students, but for our faculty, for our physicians, which really leads them to understand, to comprehend the 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 incredible um, importance of these social factors. We recognize that we may not always have the ability to really impact change in some of these social areas, but we can understand those changes and we can, we, can, we can use that to contextualize the patient's experience when they walk in to see us. We'll say, oh, I understand why you were unable to take your diabetes medications. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that your grandson died in a, in a drive-by shooting. That's, that's, I'm really sorry to hear that. So until we have that understanding, we won't be able to really present the empathy, the compassion that, we, that should be part and parcel of what we do as physicians. And so in, in thinking about that and the social determinants of health, um, as an academic health institution, what is our social responsibility beyond that just providing um, health care for patients? So um, Ken Lutmerer, who's actually a professor of medicine at Washington University, wrote a critical book, uh, Time to Heal. And in that book, he really talked about this social contract that we in academic medicine have to realize that our existence is dependent on our ability to improve the health of the community. Uh, that's been embedded in the, uh, in the ethos of, of medicine since the turn of last century, uh, the, uh, turn, no, the turn of the 20th century. And only recently uh, have we begun to craft policies that really will allow, uh, not allow, but really push academic medical centers, prod them to really doing this better. And so if you recall, uh, when the Affordable Care Act was passed in 2010, there was a component in there that stated that academic health centers, in order to continue to receive disproportionate share of health funding, had to engage in a community health assessment. Uh, and that, that, that meant those, those academic health centers had to ask themselves, what are the major health issues in the community that our patients are, are facing? They're bringing those health issues, and those social issues and health issues into this clinical space, and what can we do then to improve their lives out there as well as in, in here? And so those community health assessments were a main driver, uh, compelling academic health, academic health centers to look beyond the emergency room, beyond you know, the OB suite, and to the community. Now, I think that the benefit of, of that uh, is that many academic health centers are now aligning themselves with other hospitals in their community, with community health centers, and with departments of health, creating uh, a joint uh, community health assessments. And I think this is absolutely the best thing that could happen, that collectively they're saying, you know what, we can't do this by ourselves, but look at the resources we have 
Uh, and so they can, we can, we have this collective impact that we can then, you know, engage. By doing these things, rather, we can have this collective impact on the community as a consortium of healthcare uh, providers and, and institutions. And so this is what we have been led to do, and I would love to see us, see us ramp this up even more so because it's, it's a natural, it should be a natural phenomenon to want to align ourselves to address these social factors uh, through this community health assessments. So when we look at educating our students, not all our students are going to be in an academic health center. Most of our students are from Tennessee and they stay in Tennessee. So we're embarking on this big idea project where we are going to teach our students more about social determinants of health, the need to positively impact their communities wherever they might be and the people they serve. So I want to see if you'll give us a call to action. So what advice would you give us about focusing on the learning that needs to happen in the classroom and maybe in the clinic and in the community. What do we need to do? Give us our charge. Sure. Uh, thanks. And I really applaud you for, for, for leading that effort. There, we, there, we, we have to look at how we're doing this in a manner that's going to be sustainable, in a manner that's going to be transformative. Because if we go out and talk about these issues in a classroom, the students will come there and they'll say, okay, I had that lecture. Check that box. Okay. Where's my grade? Can I go on and do uh, the next uh, course? And this has to be delivered in a much more holistic manner. And it has to be, a, it has to be attentive to, to how, how students learn. And our students learn by thinking it through, by doing it, by actually having experiential activities. And so they, they can feel this. So, oh, gosh, I didn't realize what it was like when they hear a case of a, of a client, of a patient who, had, had, who came to this country from Syria, uh, was having nightmares all, week, all month long, uh, became severely depressed, did not take uh, her uh, hypertension, her medicine for high blood pressure, and had a, serious, a near stroke. This is something that actually happened in our community, in our hospital, I share with our students. And they were able to walk through that, uh, that, that, that scenario. So the charge is to, is to take the students out of the classroom to, ex first of all, expose them to the community that they're going to stay in uh, and practice, hopefully, uh, here in, 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 in Memphis. W drive them through the communities, areas that they have not seen. Get them out. Don't make it voyeurism. Get them out and say, here's the community. Look at the resources here in South Memphis. Now compare those to the resources in Cordova or Germantown. And they can say, oh, gosh, I get it, I get it. And then give them an opportunity where they can walk through different cases uh, of different scenarios. And, 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 and then have them, they have to have time to really reflect. That's what I mean getting out of the classroom. No, no, you know, away from the didactic lectures and more time to really reflect and share with, with each other, with other students. I think that's a charge. That will get them to really think and really embody this, uh, this uh, personally going forward. So you you were born in Memphis, a Memphis boy. So I want to know if you were talking to a high school student that maybe had the dream to be a physician but thinks that dream can never happen because maybe doesn't have the means, maybe the high school that he's attending might not be as strong in science and math. What kind of advice would you give him to follow that dream and to really make a difference? Oh, so, so critically important. There, there, there are... Uh, I think of the of the kids I grew with, grew up with in Memphis, and how bright they were, uh, and but they just didn't think that they could escape. They felt trapped. And they said, "If I'm trapped, if this is my lot in life, how dare I dream about becoming a physician or an attorney? I mean, that's not going to happen. Why waste my time? I may as well go on the corner and you know sling uh, sling drugs." Uh, and then many did that. Uh, 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 and and I think that in order to really interrupt that cycle of the, the socialization to behaviors which are are counter to to professional development long term, uh, there are several things that have to happen. Uh, first, they have to have a, a longitudinal relationship with a caring adult. Uh, someone it doesn't have to be a family member, but someone has to step up and say, you know what, I care for you, and I'm going to spend time with you on this. They have to have that, that relationship with a caring adult. Uh, they have to be told that they can do this. 
They, 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 anyone can say, you can do this. The family, you can do this. You can do this. You know, Ralph, Jane, Joe, you can do this. Um, they have to have this, they have to have role models and mentors. Uh, and, and, and we can do this by presenting, uh, uh, showing them the people who succeeded in, in Madison and, and saying, you know, look, here are the people who occupy this, this loft, uh, lofty area. You know, they were just like you when they, were, when, when, when they were your age. They were just like you, and they didn't think they could make it. And look, they did it. Examples. And so I'm finding out that irrespective of whether a kid grew up in the you know, you know, right side of the tracks or the left side of the tracks, um, if we can have this relationship, if we can identify them early on, if we can give them, if we can present them with goals, long-term goals, and if we can give them the role models, that works. The programs that work in this country that succeed do just that. They're programs for high school students uh, that, that move them along um, paths for, for uh, uh, careers in medicine. Let me give you an example of a, of a program we have in St. Louis. It's called the, the Young Scientist Program. So we actually will take, we will go into local high school. A lot of these kids are in the inner city high school uh, schools and in, 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 in St. Louis schools. And uh, we bring them in and say, you know what, we're going to, you know, you have never been into a research laboratory, and you're going to do research. And they said, but I don't know anything about research. I said, you know what, we're going to teach you how to do research. Clinical research, basic science research. And they're, they, they're, just, they're just, like, stunned. They're like, you know, deer in the headlights as they walk into the laboratory. And we say, here's a pipette. Here's your protocol. We want you to walk you through this. And then it's amazing. After a few days, they are, like, they're saying, you know what, I got this. They're walking around, you know, their chest is stuck out. I'm doing research at Washington University. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and their whole persona changes. Their, their sense of self-esteem is, is elevated. They're, they're, they, they, they see the role models. They have the sense of direction. And they say, you know what, we're never going to be the same after this. There are lots of programs like that. And their programs, if and, and programs like that can be created. There are some here. I know at UT University of Tennessee, but we need to highlight those type of really robust, hands-on pipeline programs uh, for these kids. Uh, but in, in the absence of that, it, it doesn't take much other than to tell a kid that you're capable of succeeding, and they don't always hear that. Dr. Ross, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us about health equity and presenting to our campus earlier today. Are there any last thoughts you wish to share with our students, faculty, or even staff members? Well, again, I'm just, I, I'm delighted to be back here. I'm delighted to be back home. Uh, and I, I, I have this personal conviction uh, to, to see Memphis uh, step forward uh, to collaborate on these larger issues and make this a healthier community. And so I recognize that there are things that we can do here in this space at University of Tennessee, but we must be cognizant of the things that have to be done outside of this space. So, so I, I'm, I'm, I think it's imperative that, that we promote this, 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 this discussion on social contract, that our, our faculty, our staff, our administrators have to recognize that they are incredibly influential in driving policy. Uh, uh, legal policy, criminal justice policy, uh, transportation policy. Uh, uh, you know, you know. In D.C., we talk about health in all policies. Uh, that there's no one thing that you can do, no one policy you can do to drive uh, community toward health equity. That we have to look at all these larger macro policies. And I think that is important. And I use the word. I think it's imperative that that this institution with this remarkable history start uh, uh, occupying a greater position uh, at the policy uh, uh, nexus um, to really push the most critical things that can be done to improve the health of our community. And those things, as we said before, based on the social determinants of health, are more likely to dictate the health of a community than the 10% of of what we do, the 10% that we do here in this academic center. So I'm asking everyone to create a virtual medical center, a medical center without walls. Let's see Memphis and all of its permutations as, as a place that we can heal. So I want to thank you on behalf of UT Health Science Center for coming here, but mostly I want to thank you for your commitment to health equity and to the people that we serve. 
that was inspirational today, and we will have to have you back on the campus because we want more and more people to hear about this. Well, well thank you. Um, again, I, 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 I'm, I'm pleased to be here. I applaud you on putting the program together, and uh, I'm going to come back home. Good, good. So I also want to thank Dustin, who was the uh, brainchild behind this whole uh, visit and for your organization and for uh, partnering with me on the podcast. And also in the background is Dwayne Butcher, who is uh, our technical assistant today. And this podcast will be uh, available on the website of the QEP. And we're going to send some things out on Twitter. So we're going to be very modern and get the word out. So thanks for coming, but really thanks for all your good work. So appreciated. Thank you all. Have a nice day. Thanks. Thank you.